Or we can always take a microphone. question for those who might not have heard is how do we tie into this film um, issues of the, the guy who down the pl uh, pilot who down the plane uh, between Germany and Spain who was on prescription drugs at the time and academics trying to be high achievers and what's in Schomper and how does that tie into this? I think there's links to everything. You know, uh, we have a very addictive culture. You know, I grew up as a part of that and um, that's what sort of drove me. You know, I, I just always wanted to be better. I wanted to feel better, all these kind of things. Um, you know, if you're looking at the school shootings, all the school shootings involve people that were on or withdrawn from prescription uh, antidepressants. And you don't hear about that in the news. You just hear, oh, some psycho went and killed everybody. But, you know, they don't, they don't go after the big pharma companies saying, you know, they shouldn't, and the doctors saying maybe they shouldn't have been on these antidepressants and things like that. So I think there's a lot of links to a lot of bad things and usually not positive things because um, we go over also another another problem. It's not necessarily the doctors. It's you know after a while I wanted drugs. I wanted to find them any way I could. So it's us. It's the doctors. It's the pharma company. It's kind of everything that is the right thing. Questions? Yeah. Um, my question is um, because prescription drugs are so dangerous. Um, what are the uh, the alternatives? Question is. Uh, because prescription drugs are so dangerous, what are the alternatives? Uh, there's a lot of, of natural cures for things. There's a lot of you know supplements and different things that you can take. But honestly, they, they don't work as good as the drugs. You know, um, for for pain, um, it's really hard to find something that's better than the you know, drugs to mask the pain. The problem with that is though, it just masks the pain. So if you have a bad ankle, say, and you're walking on your bad ankle, um, you're just making that progressively worse. And people don't really get that. They just want to be out of pain. But the best thing to do is put your leg up and ice it and uh, electrostimulation and all these other things, not to just take a pill and go back to work. Sometimes we have to just stop and take a break and let things heal because that's what, what God intended. So I think that um, you know a lot of the alternatives don't really work uh, as good as the, as the drug. But like I said, laying off is sometimes the best thing. But there are, there are also doctors. Um, a doctor that came to the film on Thursday had a very long conversation with was actually trying to stop painkiller addiction by not using it for surgery. What they do is uh, there's several levels of it, and they um, they basically give you painkillers in a very incremented incremental amount that they dose down. And by the time you get out of the hospital, they said 99% of these patients don't need it. So things like that, doctors that look at this as a big problem, they're the ones that are going to help and save this problem. I didn't really Good question. Let me just repeat the question. The question was, at what point in the film did, in the filming, did Chris decide to incorporate his own story? I didn't really decide to incorporate my own story. And um, Greg was with me through the whole thing, from the very beginning, from raising money and all that stuff. And I sort of abandoned him. I feel bad for that. I feel terrible. Like, I sort of like left him out to try with, with the movie because I was, you know, doing prescription drugs and drinking every day. So I would like to let him speak a little bit to that and how that all. Uh, well, uh, I think from the beginning, Chris has always been very, you know, even with his first film, he's very open with his, his life and his family and how it affects him. And I think, you know, you, we were all, we were always going to use the, the bad dog part of the part of the story. So it already had kind of his personal story, you know, woven into it. And uh, whenever he went into uh, rehab, you know, obviously the first concern was, is he okay? You know, but uh, everybody was concerned, is Chris okay? But once we figured out who
got a phone? The question is really what, it, what makes one an addict, and is it a, a, a genetic disposition, is it a natural occurrence, or is it caused by the taking the drugs make you an addict? Uh, you know, I think that um, what Richard said, creating you know, pathways in the brain, that make you just think it's okay and make it easier for you to repeat the action. See, I never knew any of that stuff, so I just went with what everybody else said, which is probably in their point where they their personality. Um, I think that, you know, but, but people are different in their temperaments, you know, like um, my brother Mike, he was always, you know, he was just always very active and always doing all sorts of different things and trying all different things. So it's, I think if you try something and it's bad and you keep doing it because you, cause you like it, that would that would basically create the addict, I think. But, you know, I, I'll have to do some research to find out if that is a myth or not. rehab at Cliffside Malibu, and it was awesome for me, um, and, I, and I think that a lot of other people I saw definitely did struggle there, um, so there, there's a lot of people that are a lot, a lot deeper into it than I am, so that's, that's really hard to speak for other people, but I can speak for myself and say the thing that really helped me was Richard Tate. Um, that man changed my life, he changed the way I think, um, he told me some things that he's told a lot of other people there, but maybe it just doesn't sink in with other people. Uh, the number one thing to quit any sort of addiction is you have to want to quit. You can't force anybody, you can't throw anybody into rehab, it just doesn't work. So when you want to get clean, you can. Um, but I think that uh, a lot of these rehab centers, especially the ones out in Malibu, um, they exploit a lot of that. They exploit the addicts, they, they take a lot of money from them. Uh, Cliffside Malibu is not cheap, but it, a lot of it's covered by insurance if you have the right insurance. And um, the thing for me was really meeting Richard. I think you need to meet somebody, whether it's an AA, you need a sponsor. You gotta meet somebody that you connect with. And um, Richard told me a couple of things that really helped me. He said, you're not a bad person, you're just sick. All this stuff that you did was the drug speaking. The other thing he told me that everybody should know in this room is drug addiction, alcohol addiction, all these addictions are 100% treatable and in most cases curable. So a lot of people think, well, I'll never stop being an addict. I can't stop on smoking crack. Well, if you know about Richard's past, he was a crack addict for 15 years before he decided to get sober. So I think that that's a really important thing to know. And that's also a really important thing to look at when you're going to a rehab center and say, do these people have any of the problems that I have? And I can tell you, like, coming out of Cliffside, I haven't had one craving. I've had some crazy dreams, but I haven't had one craving for alcohol or one craving for prescription drugs or any of that. I've been pretty much okay since I went there. Well done. I want to say something on that um, about how effective things are and, and so on. And Chris got top of the line, you know, uh, kind of a treatment in a treatment facility uh, that had really good uh, certified people. It was a, a great place. And it's a very expensive place. They go about $60,000, $70,000 a month in a place like that. Okay, where most people they end up uh, doing something on the street, they get convicted, they go to jail. Uh, that was my route, you know, and so since then, I go into the jails with my church. We went to the jails, we try to talk to the men in the jail and tell them, uh, you know, that they need to be ready inside. You know, they, need, they can't do it for their wife, their kids, or anybody else. They have to do it for themselves. And until they're ready inside, they can't do it for, them, do it for anybody else. And that they need to connect of course, we preach about it, but, you know, AA and other places, they use other things for higher power. Everybody has their own perspective on that, okay? And I'm not pushing one or the other, but when it's our turn to win, that's what we push and push about. 
crowd. The guys, they're in there like Mike. They feel the best they've ever felt. You're not talking to the drug. You're not talking to a person who's irrational. You're not talking to a person who's high. You're talking to a person who's come all the way down. Their car's been repossessed. Their wife's kicked them out of the house. They have no relationship with their kids. They're in jail, and they are totally submissive. They're a captive audience, okay? You go in there, and you talk to these guys, and you tell them, because they're sober and they're listening, okay, that you're not done when you get out of here. Because now that you're a felon, okay, you can only get an eight hour, an eight dollar an hour job. Because you're a felon, you can't get your license back right away. Because you're a felon, you know, you lost your car, you lost your insurance, and everything. And when you go out, you talk to the men. When you go out, when you go home, your wife's gonna look at you as another mouth to feed because you can't bring home enough money to support her. And she had to go out and do all that and support the kids, bring them up, get them ready for school do the one, they do everything, and work. And now you come home, and you, you're, uh, you know, on cloud nine, thinking that you're healed, you're gonna do something, okay? And that doesn't work. And that's why, nine, well, I'd say, in, in, in jail, what I am, 85% of them are back within two weeks, because it's a bed, it's three meals a day, and so on, and it's not having to listen to any criticism, okay? That's one of the problems. Addictions aren't treated properly in this country. People are arrested, they go to court, and they're thrown in jail. That is not the solution, and that's why the problem is so big. Is what are the plans for the film? Um, so this was the world premiere uh, just exactly a week ago, and uh, we're now going to be playing more festivals. Um, I mean, fairly typical in the film uh, trajectory. We're going to we're talking with distributors now. I'm pretty sure that by the end of uh, this year, at the latest, it's going to be quite widely available across the U.S. and hopefully around the world. Um, so you know, check follow us on Facebook, and you'll get regular updates. But um, the plan is. Firstly, to get um, some mainstream distribution, and then Chris definitely has plans after that to use it for educational purposes. as if you have, if the parents have a different uh, perspective on, on the usage of um, steroids after seeing this one. Um, well, my, my opinion of steroids is that they're not um, bad. Um, like the movie said, and the previous movie said, that people don't die from steroids. Steroids do a lot of good things. They do all the time. They burn their things. They do all the time. The people in the cover of different things. And steroids don't well control. There's always people who don't use them, you know. Um, Mark
the question was, um, how much do you think the over-prescription over -prescription of, of drugs uh, affects the uh, escalating cost of healthcare? Um, I'm, I'm not really sure. We didn't really, you know, get into that. We didn't, we didn't really look into how much it, it flows of healthcare because it was really more of a personal thing. But I, I do think that, um, you know, when I would get prescription drugs, I would get drugs prescribed to me like 10, 10 different drugs at a time, and I would never pay more than ten dollars for them. Now that's not because they cost ten dollars, because they're, you know, I had a great insurance that paid for the rest of the bill, um, and that's that's a thing I think that you know if they overprescribe these drugs. The insurance pays for it, and then all of our insurance premiums go up because we have a bunch of addicts working around. There's something like five million people that are addicted to prescription drugs that are doing this to drive the cost of health care way up. So I haven't really looked into that, but it's something, it's a very good question that you know, we should probably look into. And that's the whole thing with this film. It's not, this isn't the all end all prescription drug movie. This is a movie that's meant to start the conversation, uh, that's, that's really meant to be the, the beginning of the conversation. You leave here and you talk to your wife, your friends, whatever about, you know, what can be done and what should be done. And that's, that's the whole idea, is just to bring awareness to this, to get people talking. I also just, just say, coming from Europe, I mean, I've been here many years, but I see with my family there how, how much quicker American doctors are to prescribe drugs than European doctors. And you look at the health system here and the health system there, and it seems clear to me there is a correlation. I just think it's something we should be asking about next time we're in the doctor, and you know, what their motives are beyond uh, the, the management they're trying to give us. We've got time for one more question. Yeah. We'll do two more questions. Why don't you both ask and we can trick the PS manager. change anything from the uh, from the film. Depends where the film gets distributed. Um, we can leave all the clips in, um, thanks to a, a doctrine called fair use, uh, whereby we can use uh, pop culture clips and news clips uh, throughout a documentary if they uh, help tell the story in a way that we couldn't tell without them. Um, and in terms of the expletives, it really depends. I mean, it's not going to be a children's show on the PBS. Um, but there are other, plenty of other premium, premium channels and, and, and Netflix and others that will very happy with that the experience really is not a problem. The last question, which I'm really pleased you asked, was has Craigslist um, stopped doing the prescription drug sales? Uh, as far as Craigslist go, uh, I don't know if there was any actual movement to to stop that. I haven't heard from uh, Senator Lou, but um, but I do know that it's a lot harder to find them because I've actually gone on there just to see. And um, I think like me and Greg were talking about yesterday, there's like people use code words. Oxycontin, and maybe you can say, hey, you want some O's? You know, and that just makes it a little harder for people uh, to, to get them and, and to do that with them. Um, but, you know, it's not even just Craigslist. I have a lot of friends. When I thought that, back when I thought this was cool, I had a lot of friends that would just get prescribed a bunch of drugs, and they would just flip them, and that's what I would do. I would just go for people sell them. And some of my friends were making $2,000 a month selling prescription drugs. And at the time, I thought it was cool, and now I just know that that's deadly. And I, that's why I need to get this movie out there to sort of undo all the probably damage that I've done. Just got to wrap it up there. Thank you all so much for coming and staying for the Q&A.